Hello and welcome to The Olive Tree with me, Julia Fisher, the programme that talks to believers living in the Holy Land, both Jews and Arabs, to find out what God is doing there. My guest today is a partner in a large law firm in Jerusalem with a particular interest in human rights. Born in the United States into a Jewish family, he emigrated to Israel with his parents as a child. He is Caleb Myers. I asked him, what made him decide to become a lawyer? Wow, that's a big question. It was basically something that um, I felt like the Lord wanted me to do. And uh, at, the, at the time, I was working in a warehouse at the Dead Sea. If you've driven down the, the highway past the Dead Sea, you've probably seen uh, the factory that makes Ahava hand creams. I'm sure they sell them in malls in England. Um, I, I was working there managing a shipping and packaging warehouse when uh, I felt like the Lord spoke to me and said, you need to go to university and get an education. So that that's making a long story short. You then came to live in Israel full time, and uh, here you are working in this law firm. But you're also you've also started something called the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. Now this all came about because you were defending your father. Yes, that's right. In uh, 2004, the Ministry of Interior, which at the time was uh, and it still is, unfortunately, it was in the hands of a an ultra religious Orthodox party in the Knesset. They started a systematic program to try to revoke the citizenship of more high-profile leaders in the Messianic Jewish community. And uh, within that program, they came after my father to uh, try to revoke his citizenship. And uh, I um, decided to represent him. I thought it would be the right thing to do. Um, And uh, I did so on a pro bono basis, of course, uh, him being my father. And we were able to successfully cancel that initiative to revoke his citizenship. And then more and more people started uh, turning to me for help in in similar situations. And um, I granted them all pro bono representation just as a contribution to the local community of Messianic Jewish believers in Israel. And uh, because it started taking up more and more of my time within the law firm, I established the Jerusalem Institute of Justice as a way to uh, raise funds so that that foundation could then pay our law firm so I could continue to take these cases on for free. Is this something that you welcomed or is it something that you felt a little bit about reluctant about? Uh, I had absolutely no interest in uh, civil rights at all, and uh, I had uh, emphasized or concentrated in my, in my legal studies in commercial law, tax laws, working for, and I still am working for a commercial law firm that specializes in, in project finance and uh, real estate development and banking. I was aware of civil rights issues, but I wasn't planning on being the Messianic Jewish Robin Hood who um, comes to save the day and ends up living in the forest with the poor people because uh, civil rights isn't a very easy way to make a living. But what happened is, number one, they came after my family. And when a problem hits home, you really um, look at it in a different way. And uh, number two, a man came through town, a preacher came through our local congregation in 2004 during this time and said, he quoted Edmund Burke who said, all that it takes for evil to prevail is for good people to do nothing. It was just the right thing said at the right time. And God challenged my heart to get involved in civil rights and to apply the profession that he gave me in order to advance the kingdom in Israel and not just commercial enterprises. So let's bring the story up to date and uh, look at the work of JIJ, the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. It's grown very fast and it's now taking up a lot of your time. What are some of the uh, situations, the scenarios that you're currently involved with? Well, we we have um, successfully handled over 360 cases over the last five years now. Out of the 360 cases, we only lost one. Um, so I credit a very good team that God has given me and just his blessing upon our work. Most of our work in the beginning had to do with uh, systematic civil discrimination against Messianic Jews based on their religious affiliation, whether it was uh, revocation of citizenship, uh, visas, passports, refusal to register children uh, when they were born, etc. And we've branched out and started tackling other issues uh, since we, we started. We uh, now uh, represent uh, victims of sex trafficking in Israel, which which is a problem in Israel. And uh, refugees, uh, Israel does have a refugee community 
um, tens of thousands who came from uh, genocide areas such as Darfur and Eritrea. And so we, we give them uh, representation. We're also working on a very large civil rights project to legislate civil marriage in Israel. In Israel, there is no interfaith marriage. A Jew can marry a Jew, a Christian can marry a Christian, a Muslim can marry a Muslim. And the definition of who's a Jew, who's a Christian, who's a Muslim for the purpose of marriage is a very narrow orthodox definition defined by the orthodox community in each of those religions. So if, for instance, one's uh, father is Jewish and mother is not, they're not considered to be Jewish, they're legally defined as lacking religion, and it's impossible for them to get married in Israel to anybody. So there's about 350,000 people categorized like that in Israel. 11,000 Israelis uh, fly overseas to get married, to come back for their own country, to recognize their marriage every year. We feel like this is a, a major injustice. And we're actually the only Western-type democracy that we found in the world that does not have a civil union or civil marriage framework. And so we're... we're campaigning right now for that to be legislated in Israel. This will help not only many Messianic Jewish believers and in, in, in evangelical Christians in Israel, but um, many other people. About it, it affects about half a million people in the Israeli society. It's very interesting that you're doing so much work on the half of Messianic believers, that they're having so many cases brought against them, because they are such a tiny percentage of the population in any case. But they really do seem to be like the grit in the oyster here, don't they? Yes, and, and what I, another thing that I want to emphasize is that Israel is a very strong democracy. And uh, it, it, um, in fact, it's the only democracy in the Middle East. It's the only uh, nation in the Middle East that has legislated, uh, not only legislated freedom of religion, but actually has freedom of religion in practice. Um, and we also have a very liberal independent court system. That's why I've won you know, 359 out of 360 cases, because I have tools to get the job done when I'm facing instances of discrimination. The problem is that there's a disproportionate amount of power in the hands of ultra-religious factions because of political reasons. Politically, historically in Israel, there are two main elements in, in our parliament, a, a right-wing bloc and a left-wing bloc. It's very complicated. At any given time in Israel, there's about 13 political parties, but they mostly set up in two blocks, right wing and left wing, right and left wing being determined regarding issues of mostly security issues, land issues, peace process issues. And then the, there are the religious parties. And the only one time that I'm aware of in history did either the right wing block or the left wing block have enough mandates to create a government by itself. So they always have to have the religious parties join in order for a coalition government to be created. Because of this, the religious are referred to, referred to as the swivel vote. They'll go with either the left or the right, just as long as they get their portfolios of power that they want in government. And the one that they always ask for is the Ministry of Interior. Why? Because the Ministry of Interior determines who is a Jew for the purpose of, of the law of return, citizenship, immigration, visas, residency, and all these very, very basic civil rights. The Messianic Jewish community falls right into that big question of who is a Jew. And, uh, and because of that, they face these civil right issues um, not because Israel is, is, a, is a terribly discriminatory uh, uh, country, um, but because of this monopoly of the ultra-religious in the Ministry of Interior uh, and that uh, decides who is a Jew for many practical purposes. Do you ever feel intimidated? Um, no, not at all. Maybe that's a problem. I probably should feel intimidated sometimes. But uh, I, I don't really. And I, and I think that, um, you know, what's the worst thing man can do to us? Uh, if we know where we're going in the afterlife, then really we have no fear, do we? Um, and, uh, and I believe that uh, as long as I have a job to do on this earth, my life is in God's hands. The protection of myself, my health, and my family is in God's hands. So I, I really don't worry that much. The raison d'etre for this program is to ask the question, what is God doing in Israel and the Palestinian areas today? How do you put your work into that context? Well, I think the, the calling of the Jewish people is to be a, a light unto the Gentiles. And we really have the ability to fulfill that calling like never before when we come to face to face with the Messiah and believe in him because he changes our heart. However, in general, the Jewish people are a light to the Gentiles in many, many areas, 
particularly in uh, science and technology. And, you know, we have by far more Nobel Peace uh, Prizes than any other uh, ethnic uh, group on the face of the earth. And God has just put a blessing upon us, um, an inexplicable blessing, except for the fact that he called us to, to be a light to the Gentiles. But how can we be a light to the Gentiles um, if uh, we have these issues of, of uh, civil rights and and uh, questions of democracy and, and inequality and sex trafficking and these other um, basic uh, uh, human rights issues in our society. I, I think that we need, if we're going to be a light to the Gentiles, then we need to have a just society in every meaning of the word. And so I really feel like the Jerusalem Institute of Justice is helping Israel become a stronger democracy, which is helping us fulfill our calling to really be a light to the Gentiles. It's also strengthening um, the local body of believers um, to fulfill their calling, um, to be the head and not the tail, to always be above and never be under, to be those who loan and not borrow, to really set a different standard. Um, I think that if we can come up to fulfill our calling to be the head and not the tail, then we'll be able to help our nation um, come up into its calling to be the head and not the tail among the nations. Uh, you can basically sum up the goals of the Jerusalem Institute of Justice to be a strong voice on behalf of Israel and the international community and a strong voice on behalf of democracy within the Israeli society. And, and I think um, both of those things uh, uh, fall in line with what God is doing. Caleb Myers, founder of the Jerusalem Institute of Justice. You're listening to The Olive Tree with me, Julia Fisher, the program that brings you news direct from Jewish and Arab believers living in the Holy Land to find out firsthand what God is doing there today. Having listened to Caleb's story, maybe you'd like to support the work that he's doing. Well, the Olive Tree Reconciliation Fund is a small charity based in the UK that seeks to prayerfully and financially support believers living in Israel and the Palestinian areas. If you'd like to receive our bi-monthly newsletter or join our next tour to Israel and meet some of the people you hear on this program, then do get in touch. You'll find information and articles on our website, www.olivetreefund.org, where you can also leave a donation. Or you can write to me, Julia Fisher at the Olive Tree Reconciliation Fund, P.O. Box 850, Horsham, RH12, 9GA, in the UK. Thank you for your company today. I'll be back at the same time next week with more news and interviews from the Holy Land. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.